Okay. So, uh, welcome to uh, whatever this is. My name is Waylon Lewis of Elephant Journal, and uh, I'm talking with my childhood mentor, who uh, is a Buddhist uh, teacher and troublemaker. We'll get into all that. And the co-founder of Shambhala Sun Camp. And there's a new book, so you can actually learn from all this troublemaking, this enlightened troublemaking, um, and we're gonna talk about it. Um, so first of all, I want to thank our sponsor, Aspiration. Um, they uh, invest money in good things, not bad things. Uh, they don't make all their money off of, you know, the usual list of uh, destroying and exploiting the planet. And uh, thank you to Aspiration, the link is in the title. So Willie, or yes. Will. Yes, Willie, yes. fine. Welcome. Fine. Fine. Thank yeah, you. I I think of you as Willie. Um, so I grew up doing the Shambhala Sun summer camp. Uh, I was ten mates with Saul Halpern in 1985, um, and uh, now that I read this book, I realize you guys were kind of just. I mean, I you were kind of just making it up as you went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where did the idea for this children's Buddhist I mean, it was open to anybody. It wasn't Buddhist only, but this Buddhist-ish sun camp come from? Well, it came well, from Martin Janowitz. Who was from Martin Janowitz? Martin Janowitz, who was one of the close attendants for the Trungpa Rinpoche. Okay. He approached Lowry and said that they wanted to have some programs for the children. All right. So he put together kind of in-town programs, and right. then he decided that he wanted to have a camp. And so for some reason, he thought the best person to work with would be me. Right. And you were, you were, uh, you know, you were, I didn't know you as a peer, obviously, but you were a wild and crazy guy on some level. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was always baffling to me that parents would even trust us to have their children out in the woods. Yeah, completely. I, I feel like if it was, I was reading this delightful story in here and I encountered this with you. We all did where some, maybe you could tell the story of the campers who wanted to take a shower and you told them the shower house was like out of camp and pretty far away. And you told them, no, we go twice a week, you're going with the crew. And then what happened? So I'm gonna add on to that because there's a part that's not in the book because Lowry edited it out because it might be too shocking to people. <laughs> but anyway, okay. These three gentlemen approached me and they asked if they could go take a shower. I said, no, we do it together, but you can get a bucket of hot water, go out in the woods and, and wash up. So anyway, I right. out a little bit later, they'd snuck out of camp and I got Lowry and I went in my tent and I grabbed some handcuffs that we had in case there were raiders and stuff on the camp. Right. And so yeah, that part's not in the book. It's not in the book, no. So we went down yeah. to the bathhouse and sure enough, they're at the closest one. There's five bathhouses that SMC and they went to the one that was closest rather than that's at SMC to Shambhala Mountain. This Shambhala Mountain Center, right? Big up Buddhist above, retreat center. Up above yeah. Fort Collins on the way to Laramie. In the okay. so we got in the, what? in the woods. In the woods. Sorry, it's breaking up a little bit, but go ahead. So we went in and there they were just getting out of the shower. So I just told them to get dressed. In the meantime, there were all these people getting dressed formally for some banquet somewhere. So the right, the was, people who are doing an adult program at Shambhala. That's right. right. So they were all there, and they saw us come in with our wow. uniforms, which we always had our nice khaki uniforms, and right. and I told them to get dressed. And then in front of all these people, I said, now turn around and put your hands behind your back. And I right. ha I handcuffed them and right. never, never said a word to anybody. Right. Didn't explain escorted them out and there was people all over gathering watching this weird thing going on and we lifted them up put them in the back of the pickup truck and then drove back to camp right on the way back we stopped and i told them that i was going to put them in this little stockade we had there with their sleeping bags and we would keep people away from them but i said the things that were wrong with what they did is one is that they thought they were selfish enough to have their own showers two by leaving camp without anybody knowing someone could have got hurt if there was a fire or something looking for it. Three, and just in case, we missed. Yeah. Uh, really, let me stop you for one second. So even though we all loved you um, and feared Lowry, uh, 
you were a scary guy sometimes. And we, and because we loved you, we really respected you. So getting yelled at by Willie, it was like the worst thing. It was like so different than getting yelled at by your mom or dad, who you kind of wanted to fight with. Like Willie, you like, agreed with you being mad at us from the beginning so it really sucked so number one number two you were saying yeah and then number three was if there was anything missing from that bathhouse or anything we couldn't account for them not being responsible and then i said the thing that pissed me off the most is that they couldn't even sneak out of camp without getting caught after all the training we'd done together yeah and i read that staff the staff we got back up top and all of the staff was just completely confused because it sounded to them like I was giving them permission right. to leave camp, but they got it. Yeah, we did get it. And it was so delightful. This whole notion, like if you are, you, you shouldn't, you should follow the protocol or the rules because they're there for a reason. And we're a community and we're trying to keep all the children safe. And, but if you are going to break the rules, at least have the, decency not to get caught right. and that was such a funny lesson like it just completely bonded us to respect for the rules in a funny way um because it was so funny and you treated us like adults i think that was a that's not even quite the way to say it but you treated us with respect well it's interesting because i don't know what it is in myself but whenever i talk to anybody i see the warrior that's in them Right. So I didn't see you as children. I saw you as a young warriors. So I could talk directly to your heart rather than talking to the outer appearances there. Yeah. And I want to get into some more of that later. But for now, what do you mean by warrior? Well, by a warrior, we mean someone who's brave enough to just actually be who they are and relax into their own selves. It's like right. not always trying to be somebody else or something else, but relax knowing that you are all right exactly as you are. And to, to see somebody that way is to actually acknowledge that their tendency is always to follow the rules of other people, how to dress, what good to cool music, all of those things that usually we follow other people's example. Right. So the warrior is one who knows that individually that I'm all right and I can do things as I wish because there's a gentleness and caring about myself, which naturally extends to others. So warrior so just this, means one who is brave in Tibetan. Right. So uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, our teacher, my parents' teacher, your teacher, has a book, Shambhala, The Sacred Path of the Warrior, which is all about that notion. Um, so, yeah, I want to say, like, from a children's perspective, we had no idea who we were um all year you know we were in school we had friends we were popular we weren't popular whatever was going on and then we had one week a year maybe a little longer with the kind of sun camp graduate program where we kind of we were invited and encouraged to be relaxed and who we were and all the cool kids hung out with the uncool kids. like everyone mixed up and it wasn't that was that Exactly. It was just, it was just, we, we allowed you all to create your own society. Right. Yeah. But it was the opposite of Lord of the Flies somehow. Yeah. Because there was actually, you were in a container. Uh huh. So what does that mean? Container is what we would call a mandala, which is a protected area that you were in. You guys lived by yourself, but the staff was right there overlooking the whole thing. And so there was a lot of stories about people trying to sneak around or do something and they always got caught. And they said it was just impossible to get away with almost anything. Yeah. Yeah. But it was always. I got away with a couple things, but yeah. Oh, yeah. But m- mostly you were protected. Yeah. Um, yeah. What. Um, what. Uh, there's so many questions I have. Uh but uh, I guess one of them would be, you know, where did the um, whole, so the first question I think we get from the public always about Sun Camp is what the hell, what, what's going on with all these uniforms and the marching? So we marched, that was a big thing we did. We did drill practice and we sang songs, depending on the year, they always changed. Sometimes they're about uh, Ghostbusters or sometimes whatever else. Where did all that come from and why did it make sense for children? 
in a Buddhist context. And well, let's not even do a Buddhist context, but yeah. context. Let's yeah. just do a human context of it. And right. that is that Trungpa, when he was in India, he fell in love with the British style of drill and uniforms, of the upliftedness and the quality of that. And he drill is show, marching around. And he wanted to show the fundamental um, bravery of, of being a human being and the basic goodness of everything in society. So he took everything in society and, and brought it all in to show that the unconditional quality of the goodness of us as human beings. So he even took the military form, right. and gave that to us to use in order to uplift ourselves, connect with our own dignity and humor. Right. And we did that by synchronizing body, speech, and mind through drill and marching, and also having nice uniforms, dressing properly. Also, you didn't have to think about what to wear in the morning because we all dressed the right. same. So it was just showing that sense of, of, of how even in the you usually sense people have a bit degraded sense of military that you could flip that. Right. And use that same thing to uplift and bring gentleness and dignity into people's lives. So that was all what Jim and I were trained in. So we thought, what better thing to give the children? Than yeah, our pins in the sort of sorry, go ahead. Well, to give them their own humor and hand them their hearts, which you can do that through the drill. Uh huh. You said synchronizing body, speech, and mind. That's a very powerful thing. It's sort of like dance or uh, other things. It's so powerful for children. When we were told by our parents, like my mom was always trying to get me to meditate, right. and it was so hard, you know, because it just was so boring, and you have so much energy, nervous energy as a kid. Uh, the chants we did in the Buddhist context were more fun. But sun camp, um, marching around, if you were spaced out and lost in your mind, and someone said, live, turn, you know, and you just kept going straight, you'd walk into people, and you were woken up, right? Yeah, and for somehow, young people fall in love with that particular discipline, and especially the ladies. The ladies uh -huh. to do the drill, and I think it probably has a dance quality to it. Right. So it's not a male thing necessarily. Or no, male. no. Yeah. No. Matter of yeah. fact, the head of the Dorje Kasung, which is the background of what we work with, which is the kind of the unarmed security team that we would work with visiting teachers like the Dalai Lama and all of that. We were trained in that discipline. And the main drill instructor in that right now is Anna Weinstein, who is the sergeant major for all of us. So that's right. all of that. So the women do good with it. Yeah. So um, you also said, you know, it was in some way flipping maybe the degraded model of aggression um, into dignity and humor and non-aggression in society. That seems like a very timely thing, given, you know, we have tweets going around about nuclear war and we have the, the Me Too movement is uncovering all the kind of sexual harassment that's been going on. There's so much aggression and degradation being that's so obvious in our society right now, this is a powerful way to teach non-aggression and gentleness and humor to our next generation. Yeah, and it's like that was back in 1984 that we started that where Trungpa saw these days coming. That it right. was, we weren't even near the darkest of what we consider to be the dark times which are here now. And right. my job in training and in teaching now is to actually help people to gain the strength to not get seduced by other people's aggression. So what does that mean? We buy into the, we say, well, to get ahead or to keep up, we have to be as aggressive as everyone else. It has to do with also that even for person, people that want to do battle with anything, they usually feed it energy. So even right. if you have a good cause and you approach right. that cause with aggression, you're giving whatever you're trying to change the walls to block you off from it. So in other words, what we need to do is through our own intelligence and skillfulness is to develop a sense of wisdom and deviousness, how to overcome things without hitting them, hitting them head on. Right. So say more about that, the wisdom and deviousness. And that's the training of sun camp. That's what the children do. They learn how to actually sneak about and, and do all kinds of things and yet do it with a sense of joy and openness and to actually see their own passion, their own aggression or their own ignorance. 
And those are the Buddha's three root neuroses. Yeah, that's the three neuroses that causes this whole thing to come about anyway. Right. So it comes, um, it comes back to simplicity, but we always want it more complicated. Right. And that was, I, I know, I, we were told with the children to just keep it simple. Yeah. Well, that was a, that's a natural segue probably to a very rare and powerful thing about Sun Camp, which is people would always say, oh, what do you do at your Sun Camp? You know, I ride horses and, you know, water skis and we learn pottery and crafts and we, whatever. And then at Sun Camp, people would say, oh, what do you do there? And we'd be like, well, you know, we make lunch and then we march around sometimes. And then we have a huge capture the flag game at the end, basically. And it's the best, it's like the best week of the year. So I remember some parents asking their children coming back, asking them that, what did you do? He said, well, nothing. We just exercised yeah. in the morning, did some drills. So they said, it must be really boring. He said, yeah, it's really boring. So yeah. you don't want to go back. No, I have to go back. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I could never explain to the parents what actually took place there. Yeah, it was like you were giving us or ch the children um, one week in the year where we could relax. And it was actually fun to relax. It wasn't like a painful detox where you just locked us in a room and <laughs> we had nothing to do. There was some gentle, playful. I mean, it was so playful. Like that was what I, reading this book, what I appreciated probably the most was there's just such a feeling of joy. Um, and where did that come from? Because fear, it's fear. Okay, fear. When yeah. The very first time we went to do one of these camps, the very first thing, and for every one of them ever since then that I ever ran, I was scared to death. Uh -huh. Every time, uh -huh. and had no idea how to relate with the children, the environment, or anything. But I just surrendered to my own training of knowing that I knew how to do the drill, I knew how to be playful, and I knew, and the children provided me with the opportunity to get more and more outrageous. Right. Now that we would invite you guys sometimes to come along with us with the conspiracy of now we're gonna march down to Shambhala Mountain Center, we're gonna wake everybody up down there, and we're not yeah. supposed to be down there. So now you're, we're all in cahoots. So that helped. Yeah, that was super fun. Um, there's great photos in this book. Uh, I don't know if I can find it that quickly, but where we would march down to the uh, the adults' world, where they're all doing serious Buddhist meditation oh, study. Yeah, and there's a story in here where some lady comes out of a meditation tent and yells at all the children in Jim Lowry, saying, "Be quiet! Stop yelling! We're trying to meditate. We're trying to practice." And he said, "What did he say?" He said, we are, she said, we're trying to practice here. And Lowry yeah. said, we are practicing here. Yeah. yeah. We went on so, yelling and screaming, kiki, so, so. So, um, you know, I staffed at camps after I was um, a kid at the camps, um, a child. And um, I remember, I still tell the story to all my staff because it taught me so much. Um, one it was up at Dorje Den Maling and we were supposed to have dinner ready and we didn't have dinner ready for like a hundred children or however many there were. And we all ran over. I don't remember why, but we all ran over to Jim Lauer's tent and he was the boss of that camp. And we were all explaining to him like why didn't dinner couldn't happen or it didn't happen or whose fault it was or whatever. And, you know, Jim was always kind of grumpy and we always it liked and admired him at the same time. And he said, I don't care about your stories while you're talking you know, the children are waiting and they're hungry. And it was such, it was, there were so many of those moments in every camp where it just stuck with you forever. Like for me, that meant all my storylines, all my defensiveness, all my, and a lot of it's so good and I could agree with it and I could legislate it and I could get a lawyer for it. None of it mattered because while I was drowning in it, I was, wasting my life and other people's life. That's the spontaneity of that camp because things just arose instantaneously. So even in the space where you're not doing anything, things arose. One of the stories that is in the book is there was a young man that was through the whole drill, kept kicking the older guy in front of him in, the, in his ankles. 
stepping on his feet. And so uh, at the end, I dismissed everybody. I was going back up to up the hill, and I looked back, and the older kid was kicking the little one on the ground, kicking him. And I ran down the hill, and I was just screaming, kick him again, it's a little kid. Kick him again, it's a little kid. And then I just, wow. he stopped, and his eyes were just wide, and I just turned around and walked away. And he went up to Lowry right. afterwards. He said, I thought he was going to hit me. Lowry said, I thought he was going to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> so it was that. That was the whole thing is like giving everybody the space. But when you had the final no, you guys knew that the no was no. That's it. Don't take it farther. And even what you were saying there, you weren't saying the obvious, which is don't kick a little kid, you big jerk. Yeah. You said you just held up a mirror to him. Yeah, keep kicking a little kid. That's great. Yeah, you right. Know? And that's even worse because then he had to reflect in that moment like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Exactly. Yeah. But those things come out of the environment. So that when you create an environment like that, that you're protecting and then you invite people into it. And that's the reason that you don't allow people to go off in and out of an environment like that on their own. Because anytime anybody leaves that environment, they take energy out with them. Uh -huh. Anybody that comes in from the outside brings other energy in. Right. So that's why even when we went down for showers, we would march out in our own container, go down together to the showers, and then all come back together. So the energy yeah. is contained even in the smaller units. Well, the children at Sun Camper are age 10 to 16, I believe. And when I, that 10-year-old year is always a big deal because it's the first time off and you're away from your parents and you're going into a, a new container that, like you said, you kept that container closed best you could. And then the joy and the pride of being in that container, like you see these 10 year olds go from super scared to, you know, the final parade, right? <laughs> Just so proud and so happy and so silly. And, and the parents are so proud is this mutual, acknowledgement of like oh you're a human being That's not my that, some sometimes it wasn't easy some yeah. of those little ones would be so homesick they would come up to you every couple of hours or minutes even and say can i go call home now and you would right. hold them off from ever making that phone call you go i just want you to do this check with me later and then you get oh it's too late now so let's get some sleep we can talk in the morning you get them through day by day by day and then at the end they like their parents come and they go i did the whole thing and i never had to call you or anything and you're sitting there going yeah. oh my word <laughs> uh, drug him through the whole thing yeah well i actually so i was i actually messed that up once i don't know if you remember that um so i was a sergeant major at which is kind of um, a leadership role at Shambhala at um, Shambhala Mountain Center. And I was, I had a powerful, I had a really joyful and powerful connection with the children. I was really good with them and loved them and they loved me. And you came up, I don't think you were at the whole sun camp and you came up or maybe you were, uh, but there was, some little girl, that 10 year old girl who wanted to go home. She was terrified and lonely and sad. And I, I got down with her and I said, Hey, stick it out. And if you can't, you can go home or whatever. And I think I told you that because I don't think you were there and you were so furious at me. And again, my mentor, you know, or someone I really admired, you were yeah. so furious. And uh, you said, you just messed up her entire path. Because, and I didn't understand. I thought I had done something pretty reasonable. And um, you took me up on the hill and just, I don't know what you were like talking to me or whatever. And I was just like crying and crying and crying. It was, it was heartbreaking. But what you taught me was that I had kind of given her the option of going home. And from that moment on, she would never have two feet in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I saw that happen once and I there was someone that took three little girls out to go down and make their phone calls and their parents came and got them and they never came back to camp. And I was yeah. so upset with that person for doing that because that person thought I was the meanest person in the world for not letting them go out to make their phone calls. Right. But yeah, I, there was a willingness on your part to have some tough love. And what I learned from that, and the girl did leave the next day. 
<laughs> that I learned that um, that sort of you know you always want to be what Trunk Room Shay once said whatever your talent is you're going to kind of overuse it you're going to kind of abuse it in a way and I had such a good connection with the children that I felt like being kind was to give her an option yeah I and instead of being kind saying maybe just go join the children down here we'll talk later like you were kind of saying yeah and, and that's the whole thing is you still have the kindness but you don't give them the option you say well, let's talk about it later let's do it later right so, yeah and then they grow up but there's the other side of that is there a lot of times i would ask at the beginning of camp because i know that some parents made their children come to some camp the very and i would say is there anybody here because their parents made them be here and that you mm. don't really want to be here and if anybody raised right. their hand i would just say you can go sit in the shade, play cards with yourself, do whatever you want. And anytime you want to join in, you're free to join us. But we're not going to make you do anything that you don't want to. So you go over and relax. And pretty soon they'd sit in the shade and see people having a good time. And they would just get up and rejoin the whole thing. Then, But then they'd be doing it of their own accord. That's right. They brought themselves in. They have no one to blame but themselves. <laughs> yeah. So, so this book... You know, it goes, it has three different sections. One is all the kind of traditions and one I think is stories and one is something else. I've only read the second section because I just got it from my mom. She went through the whole thing and found every photo where I like half of my face is in it and marked it with a heart. Um, there's, a cute, but, uh, there's a cute one of you with the two Mikeys and Shinya. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. And um but this whole book kind of lays out this mandala, as you said, this container, this organism that you all created organically with the children every year. And so I, I really want to thank uh, Jim for putting this together and for you for doing all, you know, contributing all those stories and all that. It's a real, this is a real resource. And I, I want to encourage people, this isn't just for uh weirdo buddhists like willie and i this is like sun camp always was open and children don't need to be religious particularly it was for anyone yeah and it's, it's also it's at, at three different places you have one in colorado in nova scotia and in france and right. a lot of a lot of just people bring their friends and buddies in and they come and go through the whole thing so it's more of a training of how to actually be and kind and fall in love with yourself it's a training in that that ground a training and falling in love with yourself which automatically happens that you when that happens you're automatically kinder and nicer to people around you right and so our whole right. goal is to create a culture of kindness and right. that's where we start yeah so anyone so any child 10 to 16 can go to sun camp that's right right and just and, call to one of the staff and let them know, you know, ahead of time, if you want your children to come, talk to somebody on the staff so that they'll keep an eye out for them and everything else and make sure that they actually get taken care of. Because the older children take care of the younger children, and it's all that self-contained thing with that. So that's what makes it wonderful. And there's no belief system. There's just the sense of surrendering to doing, to having fun, doing things you wouldn't expect to have fun at. Yeah, and it is, it's a real tonic as well to the kind of helicopter parenting thing where everything is like putting kids in handcuffs and having a good sense of humor and being mischievous. It's like, it's so real and fun. Maybe we should edit out the handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but really, there's there's so much uptightness. Like parents yeah. turn their love, their very real love, into fear and and uptightness around our children, especially in the scary world of ours. And it's understandable. But this is a way to let go and for the children to really grow up and find out who they are and have fun doing it. Yeah, which is kind of magical. Yeah, and the children after their first couple of years come home with so much more confidence and a smile in themselves. Yeah. And matter of fact, Sakyong Mipa, the head of the Shambhala nowadays, gave all of the sun campers their own secret salute. So that when they're back in school and they're back in their own cliques, you know, the nerds over here, the jocks over here, right. and, you know, all the punks over here, and they're in their own cliques. When they see each other, they still have a way of actually connecting and remembering their experience together. 
And that's oh, I love that. Loot is just this. Nice. And On the heart? It's just, or in the middle? It's just right at the heart. Sun shining from the heart to me to you. So they would just do that as acknowledgement. And so that was kind of the secret little handshake, which he gave that to them all this last he didn't say a word about it, but at the end of his talk on the fall equinox, he actually did that at the end of the talk. I love that. Yeah. Well, maybe we could conclude by touching on the slogan of the camp, which is also another thing that's always stayed with me. Um, it was on the back of our T-shirts. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that meant. Well, it's if you lose your mind, come back. And so, yeah. that's just a reminder that we always, all of us, lose our minds. Yeah. Get caught up in by the hooked by anger, whatever sort of thing, passion rises up, and when we're caught with that, we lose our mind. And so that all it means is that we can come back. But what it also means is that we don't have to condemn ourselves. We can always begin from where we are right now. We always come back to the beginning. Mm. We would call square one. So we're always starting fresh from right now. So if you lose your mind, come back. Just be here and set off again for it. Yeah, it's a powerful slogan uh, for children, particularly but for adults as well, because we're always thinking like Elephant is a pretty big website and a ton of people come to Elephant to read about meditation. And a lot of people think the they can't meditate because their minds aren't quiet or they can't meditate because they they have thoughts or they can't meditate. You know, if you lose your mind, come back means you will lose your mind again and again and again and again. You know, so I actually take meditation in prison, so it it works for everybody, right? For children and yeah, in prison, and I don't yeah. treat the prisoners any different than I did the children. Yeah, well, Willie, I'm so grateful uh, to you and uh, for what you've done and what you continue to do. And I guess the maybe one final thing uh, while I have you is one amazing thing about Sun Camp is. It wasn't a cult of personality. It wasn't about you or Lowry, um, although it kind of was, but it didn't stay that way. Uh, a whole new generation is leading the Sun Camps. And their children. And their children. Yes, their children. The children of the first generation are already graduating and coming back to staff. So it's yeah, and for all of us. What's that? Into the third generation of people being on staff. Wild. So that, you know, that's something that businesses like mine or um, we're all trying to figure out how do you pass along the kind of mission in a way that people get it and can carry it on independently um, and have their own magical learning moments. Um, so how were you guys able to kind of hand the reins over uh, to the next generations? <laughs> we got out of the way. Right, right. Yeah, remember we spent ten years of actually working with all of you and training and doing that. So yep. by the time that we stepped down from it, there were already people ready to come in and take place. And we also right. had to have to give a lot of credit to Mitchell Levy, mm. who was actually held the reins and held the transition for everything going from one generation to the next. So he's still mm. actually passing all of that off. But it's mostly all of the things, the stories that we all share together, those just carry on and people pick that up from each other. And then there's new things that happen. The wisdom of, of that environment creates the leadership of the future. So the Sakyong Mipam Rinpoche said that it's actually not a sun camp for children. It's actually a leadership program for the children to grow up into for the future. Right. He said, well said. said if we could have a program like that for the adults, we'd have it made. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, we're not, um, yeah. One last thing from me. Yeah. Smile if you have to. Smile if you have to. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that was one of our slogans. That was right? it. Yeah. And what is what does that mean? Lighten up, dude. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much. A pleasure. Uh, yeah, a real pleasure. I, I love you, love you and I'm grateful. And uh, within that love and gratitude uh, is an immense uh, enjoyment and uh, respect for your troublemaking. So thank you. Thank you. And may, All right. may we continue that tradition. Amen. Smile if you have to. <laughs>